Warning, this content may be upsetting or disturbing to some audiences. The soil had fully preserved one side of the body. Forensic investigators, what are some of the most disturbing and horrific cases you've worked on? Had a paranoid schizophrenic male who forced his elderly mother to eat rocks, and I mean a load of rocks, to the point where she died. He told police that he was feeding her rocks to weigh her down so God couldn't take her yet. Another case happened in the funeral home I worked in. An adult son died from an overdose in his room. Caused his mother to snap. One of her children came over unaware of what happened. Noticed a smell in the house. The mother explained that he was going to wake up like Jesus did. The daughter called 911 and fled the house. She barricaded herself in the house for five more days with the body. This dates back many years to my time as a US Army said criminal investigator. I was working a fraud case against a soldier, whom I'll call Sturgis, who had been collecting housing allowance, but actually living in his car. Total was about $11,000 so it's not like he was looking at prison time or anything. Worst case scenario was a dishonorable discharge. But his company EXO made a hobby out of making this guy's life miserable while the investigation was going on. He personally escorted the guy to all his meetings with me, the JAG office, and other than that he was basically on full lockdown. One day they had an extended field exercise, still on base, but sleeping in tents for a few days and doing, I don't know, infantry stuff. When they got back to the company grounds, everyone lined up at the arms room turn in their M16s and other various weaponry, but Sturgis instead walked out into the middle of the parade ground and sat down. The XO came out after him, yelling all the way about what a world of poop he was going to rain down on him, Sturgis stood up and shot him full auto with ammo he'd pocketed from the range. Stitched him from groin to neck. Then Sturgis sat back down and put the muzzle to his eye socket and held the trigger down for as long as he could. Once the duty agent who got the call put together who the cast of characters was, he called me since I had the existing case file. When I got there the EXO's body was gone, they'd taken him to the ER but dead on arrival. Sturgis they didn't bother with since his head looked like a deflated basketball. Turned out that the bullet from his rifle went right through his brain and shattered the top of his skull, and the muzzle gas pushed his brain completely out of his skull. One perfect hemisphere was laying next to him, the other a surprisingly long distance away and had landed in an anthill and was crawling with ants. I used a tongue depressor to roll the loose parts of Sturgis into a plastic bag. His autopsy was the next day, and I attended to take photographs, for the file, not a personal thing. That was almost 30 years ago, and I can still hear the medical examiner say uck, there's ants all over this thing. Like sorry dude, was that the thing that made this job too real for you? Recently read a story about a lady's boyfriend who beat her minor son constantly, then finally to death after he defecated on the carpet, he wasn't being fed and was eating out of the garbage. The mother said she slapped him to wake up and stop pretending he was dead like he usually does after a beating. Once she realized he was dead, she gave him a bath, went to put on her makeup and wig, then began to read the Bible to him, before taking him to the hospital. 15-year-old jumped off an overpass on the freeway, but he was reported to be seen on the ground on the freeway by the first person who called it in. Who was also the third car to hit him in a matter of minutes. I didn't even have to cut to do the autopsy, we were able to get what we needed through the gaps in his broken spine. It was a late night case. They all stopped, it was just the first person that we got a call from was the third guy. Honestly, there might have been others that didn't realize it was a person, but all three of the ones we knew of did stop. The first guy said he didn't see anything as much as he felt it. The second car was, according to the report, hysterical, and the third called us on the side of the road with the other two. I did a case once where the home had burnt down. As was always the case, the homeowner was asked to provide a list of everything in the home, tip, make this list before your house burns down. Most people, not this guy, can't remember and this is how insurers shortchange you. But I digress. So homeowner emails me a list, all 190 pages of size 12 aerial print single spaces. The first 48 pages were all the books in the house. Every single book and I mean all of them, over 3,200 in total were biographies, memoirs and other books related to serial killers. And then, as if to prove the old saying it is the ones you least suspect, he was a normal dude, middle age etc. wife, two kids and so on. Police arrested him two months later when the house was demolished and six bodies were found in the crawl space under the house. I do fire investigation and one that stuck with me was a likely mentally disturbed girl that started speaking to God at the dinner table. 
And then that night lit her room on fire with her in it. I think about that one a lot. Worked a case involving two young sisters, 13 and 6, if I recall, this was 20 years ago, and their meth head mom and her boyfriend. Mom was convinced her girls were possessed by demons, so she forced them to take baths and bleach. When that didn't work, she started making them drink bleach. The older girl knew enough to immediately throw up the bleach, and she would drag her sister behind the couches or wherever they could in the house to throw it up. Eventually the little daughter couldn't throw it up anymore and died. She then froze the little sister, and proceeded to hack the frozen body into pieces in front of the older sister, and then disposed of the pieces somehow. We were sent in to see if we could find the body. Walking into that house, the smell of bleach was overwhelming, and I can still remember all the bleach stains on the carpet. Last week, I had 9 homicides, 4 multiple gunshot wounds, most being 15 shots, 4 suicides, 7 overdoses, 2 decomposing cases, 1 covered in black mold, an abused infant, and an accidental shooting of a child. We've had over 200 cases in the coroner's office in 2020 already. Well over 40 homicides. They're always bad. Funny as it sounds, we're not even big shots in crime, possibly in drugs, though. Last week was heavy for us. We usually have about 15 cases a week of homicides, ODs, and a few odds and ends. I actually just finished my rotation and I was in tears, because I was so happy to be done. I learned a lot, but forensics ain't for me. Long story short, arson case. Two kids die. Lady who started the fire also lived in the house but got kicked out by the owners for whatever reason. She had a previous felony arson charge. They found her a few days later living with her boyfriend in a tent with multiple gas cans. She was arrested and released with charges completely dropped. That's when I realized one, how messed up our judicial system truly is and two, I didn't want to investigate homicides anymore. Back in my forensic anthropology student days, we worked on an unknown, unclaimed skeleton for class. We'd analyze these skeletons for class as part of our weekly projects. The story goes like this. This Jane Doe was new in town but made some fast acquaintances at a local bar. Jane Doe and her three new friends get the bright idea to go rob the local motorcycle gang. The gang has a house in town, but they're not there right now. Just a couple of their old ladies. So these four brain surgeons come up with a plan. Jane Doe and another woman will go up to the door in a panic. They'll bang on the door and scream for help. The two guys would wait in the bushes and spring out once the door is opened. Then they could rob the house. So with plan in hand, they get to the house. Jane Doe and the lady run up and start banging on the door. Screaming bloody murder about someone bring after them. Inside are two of the gang's girlfriends and wives. They figure something is up. One gets a shotgun, one gets on the phone and dials 911. The women outside are banging so hard on the door it begins to break and come apart. Lady with the shotgun is scared and has it pointed at the door. The door breaks open and Jane Doe is the first through the door. Shotgun lady lets both barrels rip and deletes Jane Doe's face from eyebrows to chin. This was back in the 90s. I wonder if they ever figured out who she was. Rookie police officer here. It was my first full year on the streets and morning roll call just broke and I got into my patrol car and started to get myself situated for the day. Then a call comes over the radio for a person with a weapon which is a fairly common call in my area of patrol, so you never really know what you're gonna get. So I get to the address that radio gave me and get out of my car and start going towards the property where the call came from when another patrol car shows up and meets me at the door, but it's locked. So we start knocking very loud and hear a young woman crying and screaming and she eventually opens the door and shouts, upstairs third floor, and points up the stairs. So we don't have any information whether it's a gun, knife, bat or anything, so we draw our firearms and start up the stairs. I was the first inside the third floor and all the lights were out and it was still dark outside, so I draw my flashlight and start making my way around bends and turns of that floor when I see some lady sitting in the couch, and I say ma'am, where is he at? As I cross in front of her with my flashlight and clearing the rest of the room when the cop behind me put his light on the lady and sees she has a 12 inch knife in the center of her chest. Turns out the woman was smoking PCP the night before and stabbed herself in the chest, What's weird about it was that she was sitting upright with her eyes open and her head straight. Then we looked at the floor and it was covered in blood. So after stabbing herself square in the chest she walked around a little bit before sitting down on the couch and passing away. Stay away from drugs. 
I had one case where a mentally ill guy killed his ex-wife and was driving around school to school in the city looking for his kids to kill them, and then kill himself. He didn't know which schools his kids attended and there are many in the city. My girlfriend is a city school teacher. When I learned this was happening I called her and told her to lock everything. I've never been so scared in my life. Fortunately for everyone he was caught in a shootout with the police and if I remember correctly, the National Guard, or SWAT I don't exactly recall which. He was shot and killed, thankfully, but unfortunately, the only casualty was his ex-wife. I'm still fresh in the field and don't have any super horrific stories, but I interned with a police department while working towards my masters. I went to a scene with a deceased adult male. Suspected overdose and very recent, he was dead for around 8 hours, if I remember correctly. Nothing gruesome, but his parents found him. They were crying in the next room as an officer spoke with them. At some point we went into the deceased's bedroom, which he shared with his toddler, and I distinctly remember seeing all the toys on the floor and how they were the same ones my little cousins had. I started getting a bit emotional, but then we found bags of powder hidden in the child's clothing drawer. At the university, I took a medical legal investigation course that was taught by a medical examiner. Lots of case photos, but the one I remember was of a suicide bomber. The explosives he had wrapped around himself exploded downwards. Everything below the waist was either gone or a tangled mess, but his top half looked completely untouched. I also did a mock reconstruction report for the 1970 McDonald murders. I had access to scene and autopsy photos, including those of the children. These were almost 50 year old pictures so the quality was not the greatest, but I don't think I'll forget them for a long time. I worked in CSI in Mexico, once we went to a safe house where the police found 14 people who were tortured and executed you could smell the iron from the entrance. Upon entering there were two women with broomsticks taped to their genitals. In the upstairs bathroom they found a woman tied to the toilet, died of dehydration, had urinated and defecated on her for days. It was evident that they also assaulted her and beat her before turning her into a toilet. One of the rooms had five shackles on the wall and in the center a metal bucket with water. The five people died of hunger and from beatings. The sickest was in the backyard, in a warehouse without windows there were several bodies that had their faces and hands removed. It was like watching a horror movie, but that's the narco in these places. Used to work in the field. Craziest was a chap who tied a steel cable to a tree, then threw his car window secured it around his neck, then floored the car. Cable ran out of slack and, well, pop. Always amazed me how clean it came right off, decapitations are normally pretty messy but this guy's creativity led to a fairly clean, instant, and memorable death for those who worked his case. Oh and also toxic mega colon, google image search that, just not during dinner. Just imagine dying of a 20 kilograms turd stuck in your guts. Was like delivering the world's worst baby when we pulled it out during the PM. Digital forensics here. I had to sit through a film of a blindfolded, screaming girl being abused every way you can image by two overweight Russian men. The film lasted about three hours, and the abuse would have caused her permanent injury. The denouement was where the bag was taken off her head and a gun was presented to her face. If you've never seen a young person suddenly realize their own mortality then I suggest you never do. One of them pulled the trigger and her head disintegrated in a shower of red mist and brains. The other held up a newspaper which was to show the date. The film had been commissioned by someone else who wanted this to happen, presumably so he could jerk off to it. Humanity is doomed. As a forensics student, I helped piece together the ripped up diaries of a girlfriend who was supposedly killed by her boyfriend and shoved into a freezer. There was another woman in there too, one of the big freezers with the lift up lid. The police found evidence that the freezer had been off a couple times as the boyfriend ran out of electric too. I was an intern but. Guy finds out his lover was cheating on him, flies into a jealous rage, and stabs the guy to death with the handle of a frying pan. He gets him the first time in the kitchen. Vic manages to get free and runs up the stairs. Gets caught and stabbed again. Gets free again and makes it to the bathroom, where he gets cornered in the tub and stabbed to a bloody pulp. Me and another intern were tasked with picking bits of organic matter from the drain with tweezers. Not a crime scene investigator. But in uni I did crime and investigation and part of it was reviewing old cases. We were lucky enough to have a talk from the lead investigator on the Myra Hindley and Dean Brady case. During the talk we got to review the official crime scene photos including one that as far as I'm aware the press nor family had ever seen. By the way and we had anything that we could use to take a photo taken off us to prevent anything being leaked online. 
One was a photo of a half skeleton and half human as the soil had fully preserved one side of the body. Even though it was just pictures, they are images I wish I'd never have seen, along with some of the six stories you heard, about what people had done, it made me never do anything with my degree. I work in forensic pathology, I'm usually just on the surgical side, however, I live in an extremely rural area so I regularly alternate between surgical and forensic. I actually love it. One case that absolutely crushes my spirit involved one of my old high school classmates. I saw the results of child abuse on an 11-month-old with stages of healing dating back months. The child's skull looked like pop rocks on the scan. Her husband was the one prosecuted, and she's still free. Her son survived. Somehow, I thought when I was asked to just look that they were absolutely gone. She lost custody of all of her children. I can't for the life of me understand how she gets to walk around and post pictures of her children on Facebook when there's no way she could have been ignorant to the situation. Every case I see with a child hits hard, but this one has stuck with me on a personal, emotional level. My husband and I were both volunteer EMTs. My worst call was a couple who were on their way to celebrate their first anniversary. There was a bad storm and they hydroplaned under a semi, whose back wheels ran up over the passenger side of the car. Killed the wife instantly. She was smashed down into her husband's lap. My ambulance transported the husband, who only had a broken arm. We aren't allowed to tell passengers if someone died. So I had to spend the whole trip to the hospital reassuring him that the other ambulance would be doing their very best for her, while knowing she was DOA. He was talking about how it was their first anniversary and, she was three months pregnant. I totally checked out after that call and only lasted another month or so. I was still in the emergency department doing paperwork when he got the news and that wail of grief still haunts me. Thanks for listening to Radio TTS. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell for more videos. Click the right box for the cops and forensics playlist. Let us know in the comments what you think about these stories.